at first. So you want me to speak about what was it? Uh, I mean, any, anything uh, about Bhagavad Gita Maharaj because I think uh, not all of them actually like uh, what to call. Um, um, not all devotees. Some of them should not, not never know about Bhagavad Gita. A majority should know because I already uh, conducted class. Mm-hmm. But maybe you can give your insight to them why Bhagavad Gita is actually important. Because you see, yeah, most of them actually working, engin- especially engineers, they're having like a mechanical life. <laughs> <laughs> mechanical like, life, yeah. Mechanical life, like uh, especially when, once they start, start to start to, do, to work, uh, what I see, they cannot have uh, uh, spare the time even for their own self, not to speak about Bhagavad Gita. For example, they, they ask, the manager asked to stay uh, until 8 p.m., 10 p.m., they still stay and working like a mechanical life, like a machine life. I uh, sometimes actually very sad to see this kind of situation where they, where they have to make some decision to, I mean, to have some time for their own spiritual life as well. So many, 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 many people are actually missing on that part. So maybe you can give you your insight, especially uh, specifically for these engineering students. <laughs> okay. How much time do I have? How much time are they, uh, are they able to can, give? You can have like a, a one hour marriage. Okay. You, on our own, on plus minus you can have. Mm-hmm. So I'll introduce you first uh, to them first. Okay. Then you can start with us. Yes. Okay. 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 Um. I'm sorry, Maharaj. Uh, if anyone actually using the uh, first time Zoom, if you cannot hear anything, you have to go and share the audio. If anyone using the Zoom for the first time. Okay, you have to share the audio. Then only can listen and you can speak to if you want to speak. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, before we start the session, let me introduce uh, Guru Maharaj first. Uh, so His Holiness Bhakti Vikna, Vikna Vinasha Narasimha Maharaj was initiated by Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada, if you know, uh, he is actually the the order of uh, um, uh, various uh, uh, scriptures actually by like such uh, like Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. So those who have the Bhagavad Gita, you might know who is Srila Prabhupada. And in London by uh, in 1971, so a year later he re- received Brahmin initiation. Since then Maharaj has been preaching in Asian countries such as India, Philippines, China, Hong Kong and Thailand. Throughout his years of preaching, Maharaj has given Countless souls, the practical guidance and inspiration. Maharaj took Sanya's order in Mayapur in 1994 from His Holiness Tamil Krishna Goswami Maharaj. Whoever gets to know Maharaj admires and respects his sincere and faithful practice for chanting the holy names of the Lord. He truly walks his talk. Maharaj has been teaching in the, with the Mayapur Institute since its inception. Maharaj actively participates in his Kamlesha Yatras and keep inspiring many devotees. Maharaj also famous for conducting Guru Dispaid course and also assisting for Bhakti Shastri training in Malaysia. This is prevalent as Maharaj has many initiated disciples in Malaysia. So we uh, really are uh, truly um, happy to invite Maharaj for us to be to be in with us to share your what to call you have abundance of experience and knowledge. But for us maybe you can give like some inspiration. That's actually what we want. And uh, all students, actually, if you want to ask any question, maybe you can type in the chat box and uh, later maybe we can read it after the uh, session. So I think, Maharaj, you can start now. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. I'll just say a few prayers before we begin. Om Jnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sanyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Payevacha Patitanam Pavan Hebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha 
Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so very happy to have this opportunity to speak to all of you this morning. I just heard that you're all mainly from engineering background. Excuse me, Maharaj. Can, can I record this session? Yeah. Is it, okay. Can I record this session? Oh yeah, please okay. do. Thank you. This meeting is being recorded. Yeah. So hearing that you're all mainly from engineering background, I'm encouraged because I also had an engineering background. And interestingly enough, before joining this uh, Krishna consciousness, before entering into this way of life, I studied engineering. I studied from a, a college which is now here in Malaysia also. They have a campus in Malaysia, Harriet Watt. So I graduated from there oh, 50 years ago now. <laughs> so more than maybe a little over 50 lets you know how old I am. Anyway, uh, I'm not the body. That's the main thing we want you to understand today. That I'm not the body and neither are you. We're living in a body. And the body is temporary. We have to understand the nature of this life and the nature of our own existence here in this world. We've taken birth and we've accepted a material body. Why? Why did we take birth? We didn't choose. We didn't choose where we're taking birth. We were forced. And we were forced by laws of nature. There are laws of nature. Just as there is a, a in, in the course of having a child, there has to be a mother and there has to be a father. The father will plant the seed in the womb of the mother and the child will take birth. So in the same way, there's a father, the supreme, the supreme absolute truth, and there's a mother, the material nature. So we have all come through the material nature and due to contact with the material nature, we took this material body. We have to un I want you to understand that the science of Krishna consciousness is unique. It's different from what we learn at college, what we learn in school. You know, we think we're studying science, but all we're learning is material science. When you come to Krishna consciousness, you have to develop the understanding of spiritual science. There, there is not just only matter, there is also spirit. Now, unfortunately, people are not educated to understand spirit. In the Bhagavad Gita, you know, if I quote Bhagavad Gita to you, I know some of you are not familiar with the Bhagavad Gita, probably most of you. But anyway, I'm going to quote some things which are said there in the Bhagavad Gita because Bhagavad Gita is like our law book. Just like if you were a lawyer and you go to court and you're defending someone, you would give evidence from different uh, cases which had been already heard and tried before in the court. And you may quote from another law book. And so similarly in presenting Krishna consciousness, we give evidence from Shastra. Shastra means scripture and scriptures are books like Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is the, the basic book of spiritual knowledge. Bhagavad meaning coming from the Bhagavan and Gita meaning song, song because it's in Sanskrit, right? I was, I was reciting some prayers in the beginning 
they were also in Sanskrit. The most important and the most powerful of all the prayers is the Hare Krishna mantra, which is a very simple mantra, only three words, but very, very powerful, and it creates a very powerful spiritual atmosphere. So I hope you're all familiar with the Hare Krishna mantra. In course of time, we like to also chant, we do kirtan, where we sing the names of the, the Supreme Lord. And it creates a very spiritual atmosphere. So my point was that, that there's material, there is also spiritual. There's material life, there is spiritual life. There's a material body, there is also a spiritual body. Within this material body, which we are all existing in at the present time, there is also a spiritual particle. And that spiritual par particle is the living force within the body. If we were to ask people, what is the difference between a living body and a dead body, right? Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada was my spiritual master. I met him in London. He came to London, he'd been in America and he came to London. I met him, I, I took initiation from him. I, in other words, I'm his disciple, his student. And he told us how he had gone to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, right? You're all familiar with MIT, very uh, big name and field of education, you know, one of the premier institutions of modern science. So Srila Prabhupada was invited to give a talk there. So he asked the people listening to his class, he said, who can say what is the difference between the living body and the dead body? But nobody could answer. Nobody could give a proper answer. They spoke about this and that, and, but they couldn't, they did not understand what was the real point. The real point is that in the dead body, there's no soul, there's no life, you could say. Why is there no life? Because the life comes from the soul. And when the soul leaves the body, then it becomes a dead body. Now that soul, which is giving life to the body, has no material qualities. In other words, you cannot see it with the eyes, you cannot measure it, you cannot weigh it, you cannot detect it by our empirical attempts, you know, all of our scientific attempts to measure and to calibrate and understand things. It can never reach to the understanding the soul. How can we understand the soul? It's based, that requires hearing. We have to hear. Hearing is the beginning of spiritual, spiritual consciousness. Uh, Srila Prabhupada, my teacher again, I, I often quote him, uh, he, he told us uh, how in the Christian Bible it mentions, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So in the beginning was the Word, indicates that in the beginning there was sound. If there's a word, there has to be sound. So the element of sound was the beginning of the creation. So we understand that creation comes about from sato to gross. Sound is the finest element. And we agree with that. Just as it said, we, ag we agree with the teachings of all the different religious scriptures. The, actually, all the different religious traditions are giving the same teaching, but they're just giving them in different manners and di according to different cultures. Just like 
you get pocket dictionaries. So in a pocket dictionary you get limited information about a word and its meaning. But if you get the full unabridged edition of the Oxford Dictionary, then you get a complete list of the meanings of the word and the roots and the suffixes and the prefixes and the meanings of all of these things. And you'll be given sentences to show how to use the word. So you get a much more elaborate explanation of each word in the complete dictionary. So similarly, we are presenting the Vedic knowledge, the Vedic knowledge based on which comes like I said Bhagavad Gita, scriptures like Bhagavad Gita, they're giving the complete knowledge. They're not just some, they're not just some pocket edition. It's not just like a pocket dictionary. Pocket dictionary, you get some meaning, but it's not very elaborate. But when you get the full dictionary, the unabridged, then you get the complete explanation. So Krishna consciousness is giving us the complete explanation to understand, first of all, about the nature of life. We want to ask ourselves, who am I? Who am I? We talk about my hand, my head, my leg, my body, but who am I? We say, this is mine. But who, who, who am I? Who is the possessor of the body? We say, my body. Who is the possessor of the body? Who is that? That is the soul. That soul. And the, the nature of the soul is spiritual. Spiritual in the sense that it doesn't take birth and it doesn't die. The soul is eternal and the nature of the soul is joyful. In Sanskrit we would say Sat-Chit-Ananda. The soul is Sat, it is eternal. The soul is Chit, that it has full knowledge and it has Anand, it experiences bliss. That is our spiritual nature. Spiritual life is an opportunity to come to that higher consciousness. Consciousness, full knowledge and bliss. With full knowledge we will experience also bliss, great condensed happiness. We're all looking for happiness. I think you have to agree with me that we all want to be happy. We just don't know where to find that happiness. And we're looking and we're trying. People are going investigating different things, trying to find some kind of happiness in this world. And often, so often, we're simply disappointed. We try to make relationships with people, thinking they will bring us happiness. We try new experiences. We travel and we go and we want to do different things. Sometimes we, just like you come to study and then you want to go on maybe study more or you want to take up a career and then you want to change the career. And we're always trying to find some happiness in this world. But it's very difficult, very difficult to find happiness. Because the nature of the body is not happiness. The nature of the soul is eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. But the nature of the body is just the opposite. It is temporary. We know the, the body takes birth and the body has to die. Right? Can anybody say, I will not die? We all have to die. So Bhagavad Gita also reminds us that for one who has taken birth, death is certain. So the body took birth, so it also has to die. The body is temporary. The body is also in ignorance. If we, our consciousness is focused on the body, this is ignorance. This is not 
real knowledge. This is simply ignorance. Because we are thinking, I am the body. But who am I? The body changes. The body is constantly changing. The cells in the body are constantly changing. We had a baby's body, then we had a child's body, then you had a youth body, then you get middle-aged body, and you go on and become old, and one day we also die. Of course, we don't die, but the body dies. We give up one body, we have to take another body. This is the nature of life. So the body is temporary, the body is ignorant, and the body is also not happy. The body is miserable. It's very difficult to bring pleasure to the body. We try, we will, we will take some food, we think this will make me happy. We will drink different things, we think this will make me happy, we we'll maybe take cold drinks, it will cool me down in the hot weather. So we're trying to get happiness, but it's so difficult. It's so easy to get pain. You just get a little cut in your finger and you can suffer so much. You can get a little cut sore in your foot, it's so painful, it can give you so much trouble. Each and every part of our body can give us so much trouble. To get pleasure from the body is not so easy. We try to get pleasure, we're trying to get happiness, but we always fail. It's always just too short. The problem is our consciousness is focused wrongly, that our consciousness is placed on the body. We're trying to make the body happy. What we should be trying to do is to awaken the soul and to experience our spiritual nature. And we can do that very quickly, very easily, when we begin to do things like mantra meditation. This is the whole purpose of transcendence, coming to transcendence. We want to transcend the material body, to transcend the material energy, and to come up to the spiritual platform. And we can do it very easily. You begin to chant the Maha Mantra. If you chant the Maha Mantra regularly, very quickly you can experience a change in consciousness. At the same time, we, would, we do want to hear spiritual knowledge. So it's very important for us to read books like the Bhagavad Gita. If any of you don't have a Bhagavad Gita, then you should contact me and I'll help you to arrange to get a copy of Bhagavad Gita. I'll be happy to do that for you. And we do have the Bhagavad Gita in different languages. Uh, I'm not sure though, I think even in Malay, you, of course the Malay book is coming from Indonesia, so the Basa is not exactly as Malaysian Basa, but something similar. Better, however, is the English. If you are all familiar with English, you're better to work with the English book because that's the original text. The author, who was my teacher, I call him by the name Prabhupada, he had studied English and he had also studied Sanskrit as a young man. He was brought up in India, in the city of Calcutta, and he went to a British school and he studied Sanskrit and he studied English and as well as Bengali and Hindi and things. So he was fluent in these languages. And then after studying, he had the opportunity to meet his spiritual master. Just as I have a teacher, my spiritual teacher also had a teacher. And his spiritual teacher also had a teacher. This is the proper way of receiving spiritual knowledge. It comes from the teacher to the disciple, to the student. 
just like somebody, if, if somebody says, I'm a doctor, and you ask him, where did you study? They say, oh, I, I didn't study, I've just realized it all myself. I've done everything on my own. Then you'll be very doubtful about his ability as a qualified doctor. So similarly, somebody's a, a practitioner of spiritual life, and they don't have a teacher, they never studied under, we should be very doubtful of the, their authority. So spiritual knowledge is passed down in a line. And the original teacher was Lord Sri Krishna. Lord Sri Krishna appeared in this world 5,000 years ago. At that time, he had spoken the Bhagavad Gita. The, his purpose in coming to this world was to re-establish religious principles. And he did this through his speaking of the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita is, we said, the beginning of our spiritual education. Our spiritual education begins by understanding our identity, that we are not the body. We live in the body. Just like in Malaysia, many people have their transport, they have cars or they have a motorbike, mo motor scooter or something, or maybe just a bicycle. So some, somebody's driving their car and they can, you know, you're driving the car so you think, I am this car and somebody else is on their motorbike, your motorbike or your bicycle. We're simply making use of a vehicle for transportation. We, but of course we drive a vehicle, we identify with that vehicle. And we are thinking, I am this car, I am Mercedes-Benz, or I am BMW, or I am Pe Perodu Perodua, huh? Perodua, as they say in Malaysia, there's a, a popular car which is an economical car. So we identify with these different vehicles. In the same way we identify with the body. Someone's thinking, I'm a Chinese, I'm a Indian, I'm a Malaysian, I'm a Thai. Like that, we identify with the external features, with the material body. We're thinking, I'm a man, someone else thinking, I'm a woman. Actually, this is, this is all the illusion. This is simply the body. Just like I'm wearing the shirt, does it mean I am the shirt? Bhagavad Gita gives an example. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Vachamsi, Vachamsi Jarnani Yata Vihaya Navani Grinati Naroparani Tata Sharirani Vihaya Jirnani Anyani Samyati Navani Dehi. So Lord Krishna is describing here that just like we change our dress, we change our shirt, we change the shirt, but we're still the same. I'm still the same person. Today I may have, may have on the red shirt, tomorrow I may, may wear the white shirt, but I'm the same person. I haven't changed. I've just changed the dress. And the body is also just like a dress. And just as I, as I was describing, we change the body in the course of our life. Every day the body is changing, the cells are changing, it's taking different appearance. When we're young, we have a full head of hair, and as we grow old, the hair becomes grey and maybe even drop out. You don't have even hair, you become bald, right? The body changes. So many parts of the body change. Our teeth can go rotten and we have to replace them all with false teeth. And in Japan, they do things like, they, they, they don't like to have uh, the, the brown eyes, so they, they like blue eyes. So they get special things put on their eyes so that their eyes look like they're blue. Of 
course, their eyes are not blue, but they like to look like they have blue eyes. So this is the body. It's a dress. And just as we change the dress, we're changing also the body. Just like you may, you may have a bicycle, and then you get a motorbike, then you get a car, you change the vehicle, but you're the same. The driver is the same. So who is the driver in this body? Within this body there's the driver. That driver is the soul. Without the soul, the body is finished. Similarly, without the driver, car, car cannot go anywhere. You need to have the driver. Airplane, you have to have a pilot. It's not going to just, unless you have one of these, what is it, drone. <laughs> Maybe the drone's coming. But even the drone, there's somebody controlling it somewhere, right? Somebody's got the control mechanism. So with this body also, there's a soul within this body. And we're taking care of the body, but we don't take care of the soul. We spend a lot of time and money to look after the body. We spend a lot of time, we do exercises, we do sports, recreation, dancing, so many different activities we like to do for the body, to keep ourselves fit and healthy. And we do things for the mind. We have to find mental release, you want to relax, you do things, sometimes people even want to do meditation just to relax. But we have to do something for the soul. It's not just only the body and the mind, but we must also take care of the soul. We tell the story in this regard, we tell the story about person who was keeping a bird in a cage. There was an old lady, she didn't have any company at home, she was living alone. So she got a bird in a cage, with a nice cage, and she thought the bird will sing to me all day. I'll be able to talk to the bird, and we, she, the bird can sing to me. So for some time, she was happy, the bird was there, and the bird was singing, and everything was going nice. But then, after some days, she found the bird laying on the floor of the cage. And she wondered what had happened. Because the bird was not old, it was a young bird. And when she purchased the bird, it was full of life. But after she kept it in the cage for some days, now the bird was laying on the floor of the cage. And she thought, what's wrong? I did everything. I got a nice cage. I put a beautiful bell in the cage. And I've cleaned the cage. The cage has been very clean. I don't know why the bird died. What was wrong? She did not put any food for the bird. She had not fed the bird. She kept it in the cage. She'd given it a bell, she'd given it a mirror, she gave it a swing, but she didn't put any food there for the bird. So similarly, we take care of the body. We do things to keep the body fit. We go to the, the women will go to beauty parlor maybe, and the women will get their hair taken care of, and they go cut their hair and set their hair, and the men want to do things to shave and so on. We do things for the body. What do we do for the soul? You have to think about that. We're neglecting the most basic part of life, the spirit soul. We should do something for the soul, to help the soul, to, to, to awaken the soul. Because our soul has become covered over by this material consciousness of life. We are thinking about the body. We are simply thinking about, and the body means senses. We are thinking, I am the body, I am these senses. We have five senses and we, we want to enjoy these senses. 
and the most dominant of all the senses, the tongue. The tongue likes very much to taste and to speak. We use the tongue for our enjoyment, to taste and to speak. But in the process of spiritual to develop spiritual consciousness, that we could say for the practice of yoga, we have to learn to discipline the senses. We want to raise our consciousness above the body. We want to, we want to get free of the effect of the senses and the force of the senses. We have to learn to control the senses, not to be the servant of the senses, now, animals, they cannot understand this. What is the difference between human beings and animals? Human beings have senses. Animals also have senses. Animals also eat and sleep. They also mate and defend. They do the same things. Human beings do them. But a human being is meant to control is eating and sleeping and mating and defending. Animals, they do these things without restriction. They're controlled maybe by nature. But the human being, he's more responsible, he's held responsible. If we do things like a dog, then we will suffer. Human, human life is not meant to be like an animal. Human life is meant for thoughtfulness. We're meant to inquire, to understand. We're meant to inquire about life. Who am I? Why am I here? And why am I suffering? We're often, we often think, oh, I, I want to be happy. Why am I suffering? Actually, the suffering is of the body. The soul is not suffering, but because we identify with the body, we think we are suffering. We have to come out of this illusion. So the best way, the quickest way to come out of this illusion is by reading Bhagavad Gita and chanting the Maha Mantra. The chanting of the Hare Krishna Mantra is a very powerful spiritual sound vibration which immediately awakens the consciousness and brings us out of the material illusion, brings us to the spiritual platform. We can understand ourselves as a spiritual being, spirit soul. So these are some basic points I want you to understand today. I want you to understand, first of all, that we're not the body. There's no need to feel uh, that we're unlucky. Oh, uh, my body, you know, I'm not, I'm not very intelligent, or I'm not very rich, or I'm not very strong, I'm not very healthy, or whatever I'm not. But we should think, thank goodness I'm not the body. I'm a soul. The body which we have is the result of our past activities. And we'll, similarly in the future, we'll take another body depending on how we use the body in this life. So this life is a preparation for the next life. This body is sometimes described to be like a, a field. Just like if you have a field, a piece of land, then you can grow different things. You, you choose what you want to grow. Are you going to grow rice? Are you going to grow beans? Or melons, what are you going to grow? We have that choice, we have that free will. So similarly with our body, we have the choice how we're going to act, what we're going to do with this body, what kind of activities, what kind of seeds are we going to sow. Chinese people have a saying, uh, if you plant melons, you will harvest melons. And if you plant beans, you will harvest beans. You get, we get the results of the things we do, the, the seeds we plant. 
So we want to be very careful and thoughtful. Human life is meant for thoughtfulness. As I said, different from the animals. Animals, all they can think about is eating and sleeping, mating and defending. But human beings are more intelligent. They have a greater intelligence than animals. We can see human beings, we, we produce, we can take the land and grow food and produce the food. The animals, they can't do that. The animals, they can just only eat whatever nature provides. But the humans, we are given this greater intelligence. And we're meant to use this intelligence to understand more about who I am, why I am here, and where are we going in the future. If we don't think about the future, then we'd be very foolish. We do, just like you go to college, you're thinking about your future. So you want to extend that future, not only this future, but the next, the next life also. We want to think about these kind of things. So, these are some points. Uh, I, I, maybe I'll stop here and just ask for you to, if you have any questions or any points which I've not made clear, any, or anything you would like to say, then you could now open up. We'll open up to all of you. I know you're all intelligent people, you're all students. So intelligent people have questions. So someone would like to ask a question? Uh, Rikhi Maharaj, uh, thanks for the inspiring session. Um, so before we start the Q&A session, uh, let me summarize first because some actually joined the session actually late. So uh, what Maharaj said today, I mean shared with us today is actually, first he shared about uh, we are not his body. And if we, are, if we are not with the body, who am I? We have to th think about it. So we are actually the soul. We are living in the body. So once we are in this material body, we are bounded by the law of nature. And when we are bounded by the law of nature, we cannot find the true happiness. And actually we are expecting for the true happiness. So the real happiness only uh, could be experienced by the soul, which is living inside this material body. So, under, so to understand the nature of the soul and to bring the real happiness, what we should do? So the answer is, uh, therefore we have to uh, uh, surrender to the Bhagavad Gita, the scriptures, which, is, which give the complete understanding. It is not like a pocket dictionary, it actually gives the complete understanding for us to know about the soul. Apart from that, we also uh, use our senses like uh, the the our hearing and then our tongue in in a in a correct way to receive the uh, knowledge. For example, if uh, in hearing we have to hear from the authorized disciplic succession, where we the knowledge actually passed by one guru to another guru, another disciple. So from there we have to receive the knowledge, and also we have to uh, correctly use our like the predominant uh, sense in our bodies like a tongue. Uh, to read Bhagavad Gita and then to hear the Mahamantra by chanting it. So in this way, we actually can find the true happiness. So that's all from the, the I mean the summary. So students actually you can ask uh, Maharaj actually uh, always uh, very friendly. You can give any uh, what to call regardless what 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 how your question is. He still uh, he'll still answer. Not like lecturers us. Sometimes we say that what question you ask, so Maharaj actually won't behave like that. So you can ask any question. If you uh, if you cannot turn on your mic, you can type it. I'll read the question to Maharaj. We have like uh, some some students actually always ask a lot of questions, but I <laughs> really don't want to ask like. Hari <coughs> Hari Krishna Maharaj. Hari Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj, I am Ruben, Rubenesh Pen. Uh, Maharaj, I have a doubt about the what happens once the soul is already depart from the body. Yes, well that's a dead body, right? When the soul leaves the body, then that's a dead body. So I mean, uh, what is the journey for the soul after it's out from the body? Oh, after the soul leaves the body, what happens? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Well, that's going to depend 
on the condition which one is in at the time of death. The Bhagavad Gita describes that there are three kinds of material consciousness. There is the mode of goodness, there is the mode of passion, and the mode of ignorance. So if someone dies in the mode of goodness, they will be elevated to the higher planets and to a higher form of life. Like somebody is very much in the mode of goodness, he's very pure and, tr and, and clean and uh, truthful and so on, then such a person is also, of course, you'd also be religious and pious, then they will be elevated to the higher planets, to the heavenly planets, for example. And they could go there and live there and enjoy their opulence and long life. And someone is in the mode of passion, they have a lot of desires and they're very active, and they die in that condition, they die in the mode of passion, then they'll take birth again in the mode of passion. They'll come back here to this place, and they'll come back into a similar condition from what they left. And someone dies in the mode of ignorance, for example, somebody is intoxicated or something, then they will take birth in uh, the form of an animal or even may become ghost even in the, ne in the next life. And so these different conditions. Are, but someone who is a pure soul, who has actually purified their consciousness and uh, got free of all material desires, then they can elevate themselves, they can actually liberate themselves from the material existence and they can go beyond birth and death. They don't have to take birth again in the material world, but they get out of the material world and they enter into the spiritual world. Just as there is material world, there is a spiritual world. The material world is a place of birth and death, but the spiritual world is a place of eternal life, eternal bliss and eternal knowledge. So the pure, those who are actually pure souls, they will be liberated into the spiritual world. And from the Bhagavad Gita, we learn that the, those who are actually yogis in devotion, then they never come back into this world because they, they understand this world to be a temporary place of misery. Even though one may go to the higher planets, you cannot remain there forever. They will stay there for some time, and they, when they exhaust all of their pious activities, they're going to come back down again, come back to earth. And so it, it's a very temporary, everything is so temporary here in this material world that it's not pleasant, temporary. You come together, you have a family, but you can't stay with them forever. You're separated also. But we have our eternal family in the spiritual world. So the goal of yoga is to enter into the spiritual world. That is beyond birth and death. So upon giving up this material body, you never come back again into this world. You go to the spiritual world. We awaken and develop our spiritual body. Is that okay, Ruman? Can you understand? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Where do you want to go in your next life? <laughs> Still practicing... Uh... Hare uh, Krishna Muhammad Prabhu. So, be a servant of God and devotee Guru. That's very nice. Yeah, be the servant. That's our position. Yeah, to be, that's our position. Usually in material world, everyone's trying to be the master. Everyone yes. wants to be the master. In the family, the wife wants to be the master, then the husband also wants to be the master. <laughs> Everyone wants to be the controller. This, this, this is conditioned life. Material nature causes us to think like that. But when we purify our consciousness, we understand that our actual position is to be 
servant. There is more pleasure in being the servant than in being the master. Think Maharaj, about it. Yes. Uh, we have other questions, so Maharaj. Can I read that for you okay. from the students? Okay, Prabhupada. So one of the students actually asked, um, uh, Good morning, Maharaj. My question is based on Bhagavad Gita. How many rebirth a human need to pass through? How many rebirth? And it, you can go through an infinite number of births. Okay, Maharaj. The, the next question is actually, let's say from previous birth, we did bad things. Will it affect our next birth in the new body? Like, is that my karma if I suffer in this new birth because of my last birth? Yes, right. The body which we get now, the body which we're in now, is the result of our karma from our past life. We were not pure. That's why we took a material body. And we take a material body, we're born in... We didn't choose, oh, I want to be in this family, I want to be this, I want to be in that, in that place. No, we were forced. We were forced by the laws of nature. Laws of nature mean laws of karma. According to our acts, we took birth in a particular condition, particular level of society. Somebody's born in a very rich family and somebody's born in a poor family. Someone's very good looking and some people not so good looking. Somebody's very healthy, other people not so healthy. Somebody is very intelligent, other people not. This is all karma. It's all due to past activities. So we have some good karma, we have some bad karma. Okay, Maharaj, thanks for the explanation. And then the next question actually from the student is, what does Bhagavad Gita say about revenge? Bhagavad Gita said, don't try to get revenge. Bhagavad Gita said, just forget it, drop it. Whatever is happening, we should understand is happening because of something we did in the past. And we should just accept it. If we think, you know, there's a saying, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So if we apply that principle, then the result will be nobody will have any eyes and nobody will have any teeth. Because we'll be, everybody will be knocking each other's eyes and teeth out. And that will go on continually. So don't think about revenge. Somebody does something bad to us, we should accept it. That I must have done something bad to them before. And now they've come to get back at me. So just accept it in that way. Right? Okay, Maharaj, thanks for the explanation. And then the next question is, uh, my question is about COVID-19. Any chances that it happens because of karma? Oh yes, definitely. This is it. It's all karma. The COVID-19 is the karmic reactions for the whole planet. Because the, the whole planet is engaged in sinful activities. We're doing so many sinful things. <coughs> we're killing animals. We're exploiting the resources of nature. We're taking all the petrol, all the oil out of the earth. We've ruined, we've cut down all the trees. We've ruined so many forests. We've done so many terrible things to the planet. We can see how the planet is heating, all the snow caps have melted, even the ice pack, the South Pole, North Pole, they're also melting. We're going to have a hot increase in the level of the, the sea and it's going to result in flooding. So we're responsible for everything, all the problems in nature, it's all our doing. So COVID-19 was also our doing. That we're trying to conquer nature, we're trying to exploit nature, and the result is we get things like COVID-19. 
and so many people die, so many diseases. Now, if you read something like Ramayana, ancient history of India, the Ramayana, and we read about in the times of Lord Rama, what was the condition of the planet, what was the condition of the people. There were no diseases like that. There were none of these things. There was no chicken flu or foot and mouth disease or mad cow disease. We're responsible. We did all it. We, we're, we've messed up the planet. We've messed up the whole material world. We made a big mess of it. The pollution in the cities, the rivers all polluted. Many rivers even run dry. Why? Because of all the things we did. So similarly, COVID-19, karmic reaction. And you can see it's having a good effect that the world's becoming a better place because of it. People are not going mad anymore, traveling everywhere. The rivers are becoming more pure. The water's cle cleaner than ever. At least here in India, the Yamuna River was very dirty. Now it's much better. And the air also is much better. There's not so many people on the road, not so many airplanes flying everywhere. So a lot, a lot of reduction in the level of pollution. It's good. People are told stay at home, don't go out. They closed all the nightclubs. That's good. They stopped all the sinful activities. So material nature has its way of correcting us helping us to give up our bad habits. And so COVID-19 was one of the reactions to stop all the sinful activities. Of course, not all the sins, but some of them. So we see everything is the arrangement of Lord Krishna. He's the controller. He's like the judge. He's equal to everyone, but everyone gets, you know, according to our, what we deserve, we get the results. So we deserve this COVID-19 and we have to suffer for that. Okay, Maharaj, thanks for the explanation. And the next question is, Hare Krishna Maharaj, my question is, if this birth, we are saying, for instance, will we born as a saint in next birth too? Will we carry the goods of present birth to next birth? Thank you. If we're a saint in this life, will, be, will we be a saint in the next life? Yeah, yeah, they're asking. Will we be a saint in the next life? And then can, are we going to bring the goods of present birth to next birth? Well, yes. Uh, generally, the, a person who is very saintly in character, or, then they will take a very good birth in the next life. For example, somebody may be the son of a, a sage, and he may be living in the forest with his father. His father is also a sage, and they live in, the son lives with the father in the forest. And they live very simply, they just eat whatever is available in the forest, you know, some wild leaves and some wild fruits, whatever grows there, they live like that. So they live very simply. So, so this, this, the son and his father, they're not, they're not doing any harm to anyone. They're very, very pious, they're very saintly. So there was an astrologer came and he was asked to make predictions about different people. So the, the son of the saintly person came and he, the astrologer blessed him. He said, may your death come soon. And they, and they were surprised. They thought, well, is that a blessing? You're blessing him, may your death come soon. He said, yes, because he's doing so much austerities now, 
He's living so simply. And when he dies, the next life, he'll get a very good birth because he's done so much austerity in this life. So the next life, he'll get a very good birth. But for the king's son, the king's son, the prince, he better not die because he's living a very high life. He's very extravagant. He spends a lot of money and he's very cruel and he's not uh, very uh, pious at all. So what's going to happen to him? Oh, something very bad will happen to him. So it better he doesn't die. Because when he dies, he may have to go to hell. But then they asked about the hunter or the butcher. The butcher, what about him? And the astrologer said, he shouldn't live and he shouldn't die. And he said, because he's living in hell, and when he dies, he will go to hell also. He's living in hell every day, killing animals and cutting the meat. And next life, he will go to hell. So he shouldn't live, he shouldn't die. But for one who is a devotee, one who is a devotee, it doesn't matter if he lives or if he dies. He's chanting Hare Krishna and he's talking Bhagavad Gita and he's uh, preaching Krishna consciousness and distributing prasadam everywhere. Next life he'll do the same thing. He'll go on with his devotional service. So it doesn't matter if he lives or if he dies. That's, so you were saying what happens to the saintly person? If he's a saintly person in this life, the next life he will also be saintly and he can continue, continue to be saintly. Krishna Maharaj, uh -huh. uh, I just want to know about your time. Can you answer the question or...? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Go ahead. I have time. Okay, okay Maharaj. So Maharaj, actually, uh, some of my students actually already like they actually like uh, practicing the the bhakti part where they actually started to chant, and one of them actually asked uh, how to motivate ourselves in uh, bhakti life. Like uh, for example, when do chanting, sometimes the interest actually decreases like that. So what we can do? What increases? Decreases. I mean, the interest in chanting actually decreases. Oh, interest in chanting decreases. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You have to be determined. One of my friends, uh, there was this one, one devotee I know, he's from America, and uh, he told me in the USA, a number of people have a weight problem. They're overweight, you know, they eat too much. So they have these places where people go to lose weight. And a big part of the losing weight program is just training them in the desire that they can be successful in doing it. And they, they put up a big sign there in their place that said, you have to want to do it. So it, when it comes to chanting Hare Krishna also, you have to really want to do it. You have to know how important it is for you. And you have to understand, you have to feel like it really means something to you. So to, to keep the desire to chant Hare Krishna is really very important. Of, but in order to keep that desire, some things make it easier. One thing is association. If you, if you can have association with people who also chant Hare Krishna, then it's much easier to chant. But if you're with people who are not devotees and who don't chant, then it's very difficult. So you have to really understand the importance of the, the environment. What kind of environment are you in? Some people I knew before who were studying at college and they were chanting, they would make an arrangement, they would share a room with another devotee or they would, just, they would just make a point to go out away from all the devotees. They wake up early in the morning and they would go out and walk and chant. They wouldn't try to sit around their dormitory and chant. 
You can't just be around people who are not devotees and chant. You have to find the right place to chant. Sometimes you can go to the forest, go to the woods, go to the park, something like this. But you've got to, you've got to get convinced of the importance of this chanting. We say of all the instructions which we are being given, the most important one is the daily chanting of the Maha Mantra. In order to keep our spiritual life together, in order to keep our spiritual consciousness up, we have to chant. It's really essential. And if we don't chant, then it's just a question of time before the other things will also come. If, if we're not going to chant regularly, then gradually we'll think, well, I, you know, I'm not vegetarian, it's not, not so important, I can eat anything. And we eat food, we eat food. First of all, we start to eat things which is not offered. Then we start to eat non-vegetarian things. These kind of things. So, from one, one thing leads to another. But to keep ourselves really strong and protected from the material energy, we have to do the chanting. We have to do it. We have to make it a commitment. Sometime in the day, maybe not necessarily in the morning, any time you, you can do it in the day, it will be effective. But you have to find the right place where you can chant. And sometimes it means going away from people who are not devotees. Because, you know, if you're going to sit and chant, they won't like it. And they say, why don't you talk to me? Why don't you talk to me? Why don't we, why don't you just sit there chanting? You should talk to me. Let's associate together. So you have to be careful. You have to get association. You have to try to find association. Or if you're not, you get away from, at least get away from people who are not devotees and go and do your chanting. And then you'll feel different. You'll feel, I've done it. I did my chanting today. That's very important. So you have to be convinced how important it is to do this chanting. And then, then you'll want to do it. Then you'll be sure to do it. But if we're thinking, oh, it doesn't matter. I chanted yesterday. I don't need to chant today. If I don't chant today, nobody will know about it. We think like that, right? The mind is very expert. The mind is always full of maya. And maya gives us so many reasons why we don't need to chant. So you have to be really careful. You have to be really on guard against it. You want to chant? You can do it. We have to know it's really, really important. So in the beginning we're enthusiastic and then we start to lose enthusiasm. That's, that can happen. Therefore, you have to understand that is the maya, that's the mind. The mind is saying, oh no, not this again, oh no, why are we chanting? Oh no, no, you have to do other things, this is not necessary. The mind will always be the enemy. You have to make the mind very strong. You have to bring the mind to take shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. And then you can convince yourself how important it is to do this chanting. All right? Maharaj, thanks for the explanation. Uh, we have a few questions more. Yeah. So, Go ahead, Prabhu. What, yes, Prabhu. Uh, yes, Maharaj. Uh, what does the Bhagavad Gita say about the end of the world? The end of the world, well, yes, just as there is end of the day with night, there's the end of the world. And after the end of the world, then again there's another world created. So again and again the day comes and again the night falls. So, you know, every, every, every day comes to an end, there's another day, the next day there's always tomorrow. And so at the end of this world, there's a period of annihilation, destruction, and then after some time, then again, creation begins. So it's going on continually. This is the nature of the material world, that there's creation, 
maintenance and destruction. And after destruction, then again there's creation, and then maintenance, and then destruction. It's going on since time immemorial. This is the nature of the material world. Just as our bodies are temporary, this world is also temporary. The material energy, the material energy is eternal, but the creation is not eternal. The elements are eternal, but sometimes they're manifest, sometimes they're not. But they're all eternal. But just the nature, like we, we, we put up big buildings, we create cities. There were so many empires. There was the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire. We can see these different things. We could, you go to Egypt, you see the pyramids, and you see the Sphinx. We see these things that we don't know who built them, how long ago they built them, how they did it. You know, these things, they're built for some time, but they, they, don't, all, they don't stay forever. After some time, the stone gradually erodes. Cement doesn't last forever. And cement gradually weakens and the whole thing falls apart. Mm -hmm. Thanks Maharaj for the explanation. The next question is, uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, may I know where does the souls come from originally? Why the souls have to take birth in this material world? And why there are different types of uh, spiritual worlds. Can Maharaj explain this process? Yeah. Why this, um, uh, where the soul actually come from and why have to take rebirth and okay. why there are different types of spiritual worlds? Yes, uh, first of all, where does the soul come from? The soul comes originally from Krishna. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, Mami Vamsa Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatanaha that the spirit souls are all my eternal parts and parcels. So we are a part of the parcel of Krishna. We're tiny, we're very tiny. Just like, we're, we're infinitesimal and Krishna is infinite. We're very, very small. We're like the spark of the fire. Just like a spark comes from the fire, spark has heat and light. So we also have qualities similar to Krishna, but not in the same quantity. So there's a difference between us and Krishna. We have similar qualities, but different in quantity. Just like a drop of water in the ocean. The drop of water in the ocean has also different quality, has the same qualities as the ocean, but in a different quantity. Or a speck of gold and a gold mine. The qualities may be the same, but different quantity. So we are one with Krishna, but different from him. And we have come from Krishna. Why did we come in the material world? That was our choice. Krishna gave us free will. Why did Krishna give us free will? Why didn't he keep us in the spiritual world? Because Krishna wants pure love. If Krishna has to force us to be with him, that is not real love. Just like if the man tells the woman, you have to love me, you love me or else, that is not love. Right? The woman ha has to develop the love for the man on her own. You cannot force the woman to love the man. And similarly, God, the, Krishna does not force us to love him. He gives us that free will. He gives us that independence. So we choose to come here in this material world. It's our own doing. Krishna is not responsible. We did it ourselves. We're, the, we're doing it. And you're asking about why are there differences in the spiritual world? Is it the last part of the question, Prabhu? What's the last part? 
Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Sorry, Prabhu, I turned off the mic. <laughs> yes. And the last part of the question actually, uh, why there are different types of spiritual worlds? Well, because there are different types of devotees. Different devotees are attra attracted to different features of the Supreme Lord. One of Krishna's names is Anantarup. He has many, many different forms. Now someone may be devote, devoted to Narsimha, which is the half lion form, and somebody else is devoted to Lakshmi Narayan, and somebody else is devoted to Lord Ramachandra, and Sitaram, and Lakshman, and Hanuman. So there are different forms of the Lord, and they all have their place in the spiritual world. Someone likes to worship Krishna as Parthasarati, as a chariot driver of Arjuna. They actually feel attracted to that particular aspect of Krishna. So Krishna accommodates each and every one of these different devotees. Some people, they're attracted to Krishna in Vrindavan. Some people prefer Krishna in Mathura. Some people prefer Krishna in Dwarka. There are different moods, different relationships in these different places. We have to understand it's not all one. There are differences. Someone likes to worship the Lord in opulence. They like to see Krishna as a king, just like Lord Rama is like a king. Or Lord Narayan with Lakshmi, you know, she's the goddess of fortune and Lord Narayan is the Lord of the whole creation. So they like to worship the Lord with great awe and reverence. And other people, they are more attracted to the intimacy and they want to have an intimate relationship with God. So they come to Krishna and we see Krishna Krishna enjoys having relationships with his cowherd boys and his parents and his gopis and different dealings with all these different residents of the village in the village of Vrindavan. It's different. Everyone has different tastes, right? Not everybody likes the same thing. We all have our different moods. We have our different natures. And each of us are attracted to a particular aspect of Krishna. And we all have a, an eternal relationship with Krishna in that particular relationship. So that's why there are many different places in the spiritual world. That's why there's variety. There should be variety in spiritual life. We have to understand, it doesn't have to be so monotonous that there's no variety, there's only the oneness without variety. No, we like variety. Everyone likes variety. And Krishna also likes variety. Krishna enjoy, enjoys the different dealings with these different devotees in different ways. Krishna enjoys when Mother Yashoda is chasing him and tying him up. It's for his enjoyment. And Krishna enjoys kidnapping the different queens to be his wives. Krishna enjoys joking with Rukmini and telling Rukmini that I'm not fit to be your husband, I'm going to, we shouldn't be husband and wife. They were already grandparents and Krishna was telling her, we're not fit to be, I'm not good enough for you, you were, so many other kings wanted to marry you. And when Rukmini hears it, she faints. So Krishna, this is for Krishna's pleasure. He's, he's taking great pleasure in all, all of these dealings. So this is why there are many places in the spiritual world. Because Krishna likes to enjoy in so many different ways. Thanks Maharaj for the explanation. And the next question is, According to Maharaj, said Krishna explained about the content of Bhagavad Gita thousand years ago. So Kali Yuga started after that. My question is, how long is Kali Yuga time lasting and what are the symptoms of Kali Yuga going to end? 
Uh -huh. Well, first of all, Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita not, not 1,000, but 5,000 years ago. So 5,000 years ago, that was just after the speaking of the Bhagavad Gita, and shortly after that, some few years after that, then the Kali Yuga began. So the Kali Yuga began, we can say approximately 5,000 years ago. And how long will it go on for? It will go on for 427,000 years. 427,000 years. In other words, the Kali Yuga is made up of 1,000 ages taken together. Oh no, that's the day of Brahma. Wait, how, how is it calculated now? Uh, and the duration of Kali Yuga, 420, four, it's 432,000 years, but 5,000 years have passed, so 427,000 years are remaining. And what will be the nature at the end of Kali Yuga? Well, at the end of Kali Yuga, it will be very difficult for people to live. Many people will be living below the ground. There will be practically no food anywhere. And the level of taxation will be so great that people will have to go and live in the, in the jungle or in the forest. Uh, at the end of Kali Yuga, everyone will be of demonic nature. And then Lord Kauki comes. The avatar at the end of the Kali Yuga is called Kauki, and he comes on a white horse, and he will just kill the demons who are remaining, and then after he does that, then they will be begin again Satya Yuga. So the next millennium will begin again. After the Kali Yuga is over, then we come back to Satya Yuga. And great sages who are in the Himalayas, they will come down from the Himalayas, and they will begin again the Satya Yuga. So at the end of Kali Yuga is followed by Satya Yuga. And the sages come. Those sages who've gone away, didn't want to be here during the Kali Yuga. They all went away to the Himalayas and they're doing meditation and so on. They will come down when this Kali Yuga is over. 427,000 years later, they will come down. They will reappear and we will begin again the Satya Yuga. But at the end of Kali Yuga will be very bad. You can no food, the taxation will be so great, people will become very sinful, there will be no chanting of the names of the Lord, nobody will do yagya. We don't know if anybody will know about scriptures, probably not. Everybody will be engaged in sinful activities. That's Kali Yuga. Kali Yuga means age of quarrel. The qualities of people in the Kali Yuga are described that people have a short life. If you live to be 40, you're a very old man. That's a very old life. By the, if, you're, if you get to 40, at the end of Kali Yuga, people won't live very long. They have a short life. They're lazy. They're misguided. They're unlucky and they're always disturbed. They don't have any peace of mind. So that will increase. All of these things will increase as we go on in Kali Yuga. People will become more lazy. They don't want to bathe. They don't want to wash their clothes. They don't do anything. They have no cleanliness, no morality. Misguided. So many cheaters will be there. Unlucky, even people who are looking for the guidance and who want the truth, they get misled and nobody has peace of mind. We can see so many people have to take drugs just to get a night's rest, just to be able to sleep. They cannot sleep without taking sleeping pills. They're so disturbed, there's so much, so much stress. Even little children going to school, they feel stress. One of my devotees I know in Singapore, their daughter came home from school a few years ago and she brought a booklet from the school. 
helping your child cope with stress. The girl was seven years old and they have to think, that they're telling the parents how to help the child cope with stress. This is Kali Yuga. Everybody, so much anxiety, so much stress, and that will increase more and more as Kali Yuga goes on. But we're very fortunate, just now we're in the golden era of the Kali Yuga. So for the next 10,000 years, since the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya appeared some 524 years ago. So about that, uh, so since the appearance of Lord Chaitanya, we began the golden era in the Kali Yuga. Just like in the winter time, sometimes you get some good weather. So in the Kali Yuga, you, it's all bad, but you, sometimes you get a good period. So Lord Chaitanya came, and there's a good period for the next 10,000 years. Good period means that it's good for devotees to take advantage and to spread the Sankirtan movement. But of course there's still a lot of demons, there's still a lot of atheism, there's still a lot of people who have no faith. Is that all right? I think it's a good explanation, Maharaj. And then the next question is, why you need to be vegetarian? <laughs> Why need to be vegetarian? Well, we would ask you, do you eat people? Do you ever eat people? Why don't you eat people? I hope you haven't eaten people. I hope you don't eat people. Why don't we, why didn't, you know, people may eat meat. Why don't they eat people? Because people are different from animals, aren't they? I hope you can agree with that. That people are different from animals. So we don't, we don't kill people, we don't eat people. Why do we eat animals? Well, we don't need to eat animals. Animals are different from vegetables. Vegetables are the proper food for the body. If you study the anatomy of the body, our body is designed to be vegetarian. It's not really designed to be car carnivorous, but it's designed to be herbivorous. We're, our body is much more suited to eating plants and leaves and grains and fruit, but we want to taste meat. Why do people eat meat? Because they like the taste of blood. That's a fact. So, a vegetarian diet is prescribed for the human body. Our teeth are flat. They're meant for grinding. Animals which eat flesh, they have very sharp teeth for tearing the flesh. You know, animals like dogs and tigers, lions, they're meat-eating animals. And they have, they have a particular body which is meant for that. They can tear flesh and they can die, it passes through their body quickly. But the human body is not like that. The human body is designed to be herbivorous. We're not designed for eating meat. Our teeth are flat. They're meant for cr crushing and grinding and chewing, not for just simply swallowing. And then the level of the acids in the human body is also not very strong. The acidity in the meat-eating animals is much stronger because they have to digest the meat. So they have strong acids within their body, which helps them to digest the meat. Meat eaters, generally, they like to drink alcohol because the alcohol helps them to digest the meat. So you can see, you eat meat, then you want to drink. You want to drink alcohol. The, the, of course, the, it's another sin, and the alcohol simply burns the organs of the body and creates more problems. So the intestines in the human body are very long and the food takes, takes a long, t quite several hours to go through the tract of the body. The alimentary canal, the intestinal tract, takes many hours for the food to pass through. And it's also very complex and twists and curves. So the, the food doesn't go through very easily. 
That's why it's better to be vegetarian. The vegetarian diet allows the food to go through easily. Without, but meat, you take meat, it's not so easy. It creates a lot of disease. You get people, they have, you know, stomach problems. It's all due to meat eating. You don't find vegetarians with these kind of problems. It's all meat eaters who have these problems. So the level of acids, the design of the intestines, the teeth. And then if you look at economic factors also, that when we use the land to grow crops and to produce uh, grains and vegetables and so on, we can feed many people. But if you have to use the land to simply produce food for the animals, so that you can kill the animal, you, you won't be able to grow much, you won't be able to provide food for many people. And so as far as economic problems go, it's much better for the economy for people to be vegetarian. A vegetarian diet allows better standard of cleanliness, you can see a lot of diseases coming from these places like fish markets and poultry markets, meat markets. There's so much disease there. And a lot of things like COVID and that, they spread very easily there. So you want to be healthy, you want to protect yourself, it's certainly better to be vegetarian. We say you'll be healthier, you'll be wealthier, and you'll be wiser. Vegetarian diet is, you'll be wealthier because vegetables are not as expensive as meat and also you won't get so sick because you go to doctors, you spend so much money and the, all the things you eat, they damage your teeth, they ruin your teeth and you have to go to dentists and go to doctors, get so much, spend so much money on these things. So you save money by being vegetarian and you'll be wiser also. Because the, the pain which we give to animals, that will come back to us. You may say, I didn't kill, but we are paying people to kill for, uh, on our behalf. Other people are doing the killing and you're taking the, the flesh and eating. So you also get a share of the karma. And that karma comes in the form of so many different diseases and suffering, just like we say. This COVID-19, this is suffering. And it's because we do things like this, because we're killing so many animals, because we're exploiting the resources of nature, we're thinking everything is just simply for our enjoyment. People think animals are just here for us to eat. They're so cold-hearted, so cruel. They cannot understand these animals also have consciousness. They also have feelings. People today, they, they, they take so much care of dogs and they, and they kill the cows. It's so ridiculous, it's so, it's so wrong. We take care of dogs. Dogs don't do anything for the people. But the cow gives the most valuable food in the form of milk. Milk is very important for the health. Of people. And certainly children, when they're born, they're supposed to drink milk. They drink their mother's milk for some time, and then after some time, then they have to drink the milk from the cow, the natural milk. And so this is very important for the body to develop nicely by drinking milk. But if we kill the cows, then the cows won't give milk anymore. And we create terrible karma. We create, it, it, it's a cause of war. Killing animals, we start to kill animals, then we don't think anything about going killing people. We become so cold-hearted and so cold-blooded that we will ki just simply kill. We think, oh, just kill them. Someone's my enemy, I just kill them. So this is the ignorance which people are in. We have to learn how to properly prepare vegetarian food. People think a vegetarian diet means to be undernourished. They don't understand how to prepare food properly. 
If you get a proper balanced vegetarian meal, you'll feel very satisfied and nourished and you'll feel much healthier. Unfortunately, a lot of people, they don't know how to cook and they think being a vegetarian means you just eat some green leaves and some rice, which is not true. The vegetarian diet can be very varied and very, uh, very delicious, very satisfying and nourishing, full of protein and healthy. Everything is there. But you have to know how to cook. You have to learn. So people need to be educated in these things. It's all education. And our education, of course, all we're getting educated in is the body. We're educating, we're, educate, ed, we're educated in the material world. We're not educated in how to take proper care of the soul. And it begins by eating. George Bernard Shaw, a famous British author, he said, you are what you eat. So you eat food, you eat that kind of food, you become like that. You eat food in the mode of ignorance, you become in the mode of ignorance. In the Bhagavad Gita is described there, different kinds of food, food in the mode of ignorance, food in the mode of passion, and food in the mode of goodness. Food in the mode of goodness increases the duration of life. It causes us to become healthy and happy, and uh, we don't have to worry about disease. And food in the mode of passion is that food which is very hot and spicy and that also can lead to disease. And food in the mode of ignorance is food which is uh, animal food, anim animal flesh and different things like this. So it's all mentioned there in the Bhagavad Gita and you'll see that in Chapter 17, different foods in the mode of nature. So we encourage you, be careful, be careful what you eat. It's very important to get proper food and to know how to cook. That's one, one reason why I ended up joining this Krishna consciousness movement, you know. When I was a student, I also wanted to be a vegetarian. It was a long time ago, but I wanted to be a vegetarian. I didn't know. I didn't know how to be a vegetarian. I thought all there was to eat was salads. And so I would, I would simply eat a salad, but I, I didn't know really what vegetarian food was until I went to the, the Hare Krishna center. And there I saw them cooking so many nice things. And I thought, wow, I really want to learn from them. So that's when I started going regularly to the temple and I would take food there at the temple and I would enjoy, and I learned how to cook there when I was in, staying in the temple there in London, that was. I joined in the centre in London and we, we would cook food there. And it's, it's so satisfying, it's so nice to get a proper meal, vegetarian food. So everyone should know these things. It's really good for you. You need to have a cooking class and teach everyone how to cook some nice food for themselves. Okay? Maharaj, thanks for the explanation. Maharaj, are you still able to answer the question? Or you yeah, have... yeah. Okay, Maharaj. So why there is heaven and hell whereby the human state of birth is just based on his or her karma? If a person does a good karma, he or her will be in better life and for those who does bad karma will be suffering in their next life. Based on this fact, what is the function of heaven and hell? So if there is a rebirth, why, uh, why there is actually a function of the hell and heaven? That's actually the ask question. Well, somebody does good, good deeds, their reward is that they go to heaven. When somebody is doing impious activities, sinful activities, their punishment is they're put into hell. So it's a punishment and reward system. The people do good and do bad, they get, they get the reactions. So that's why there's a heaven and a hell. It's everybody, everyone's own responsibility. What kind of situation do you want? 
naturally we don't we would be a bit cautious if we thought we're going to go to hell, we're going to be punished, we're going to be put into some kind of hell, definitely don't want to go there, don't want to we would think 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 more about what do I need to do to get a better life. So there's a heaven that's there that's encouraging people to be pious and to be good. Don't do any bad things, do all pious activities, perform acts of sacrifice and charity and austerity. And in this, these ways we can elevate ourselves. You know, we should be conscious. Where do you want to go? I think uh, uh, Carol Lewis's book, Alice in Wonderland, Alice went into the Wonderland, you know, and she came, came through the, into the Wonderland and she just entered in there and she, then she thought, where do I go from here? So they, they said to her, well, where do you want to go? She said, well, I don't know. So they said to her, then it doesn't matter which way you go. <laughs> because she didn't know where she wanted to go. So the same way, if you're thinking, no, I, I don't know if I want to go to heaven or if I want to go to hell, it's all the same to me, I don't mind. Oh, okay, <laughs> if it's all the same to you, go ahead, you know. Just do what you want and see what happens. You, we have, but that's not very intelligent, it's not, doesn't make much sense. You want to go, you really want to put yourself into hell? Hell and damnation? Of course, in the Vedas, you don't stay in hell and damnation forever. Christianity is a bit more, they put you into hell and damnation forever. No redemption. But in the Vedas, you could put, you, you go into hell, you stay there for some time, and then gradually you come out and you're put into a lower form of life and gradually, gradually work your way up, come up to the human form of life again. So in the human form of life we become responsible. It's in the human form of life where we're earning our karma. Animals don't get karma. Trees don't get karma. Trees are also souls. Animals are also souls. But they don't get karma. We get karma. We're earning our karma by the activities we do. We are responsible. But the body of the dog, the body of the tree, that is the, that's the reaction of their past sins. Their past sins have put them into that condition. Now we have the human body. We have a chance. What do we want to do with this body? Where do we want to go? Do you want to become a tree? Well, there was this young man in America one time and he was, and we were talking about dogs and explaining how dog life, you know, it's really not pleasant to be a dog. And he thought, oh no, I think dogs are okay, I think they have a good time, they run around all day and play with each other. And so we said, okay, then go ahead, become a dog. You know, if you're thinking dog life is very nice, go ahead. They put a thing around your neck and they, they, you know, they tie you to a leash and they pull you like that. You're, you're dragged around. Maybe you have to be a puppy dog and put on a leash. Or maybe you're a wild dog, a street dog, and you're kicked around. It's really not a very pleasant life, the life of the dog or animals, you know. That it's... And these, these bodies are reactions. They're reactions due to bad karma. So we can help them. We can elevate even these animals. We can give them prasadam. We give them spiritual food offered to Krishna. And we give them also, we let them hear the holy name. The loud chanting of the holy name benefits all living entities. So we try to chant the holy name, try to chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. By chanting the holy name, then we can help to elevate all of these different souls to come to a higher life form. Understand? Did I, thanks, for the, 
No, you can control your own soul, but you have to start by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. The problem is your restless mind. It's not your soul you can't control, it's your mind. And you have to control your mind, and you can, the mind is controlled higher than the mind is intelligence. And intelligence is seated next to the soul, right? There's a hierarchy within the body. The senses is higher than the body. Higher than the senses is the mind. Higher than the mind is intelligence. And in, higher still than intelligence is the soul. So intelligence is seated next to the soul. You want to control the mind. And you get that intelligence from the soul. You have to start chanting the Maha Mantra very carefully. And you have to chant it incessantly, every day. Two hours a day, you have to do this chanting. Your reckless mind is causing you a lot of problems. Because of your mind, you argue with people. Because of your mind, you find fault with everyone. You don't have friends. And it's, it's, the biggest enemy is your uncontrolled mind. So you have to control the mind. You have to chant Hare Krishna. And you have to do it regularly. And you should be very careful what you eat also. If you eat contaminated foodstuffs, contaminated food means animal flesh, non-vegetarian food. It's all contaminated. It will affect your consciousness. You have to eat food like fruits and vegetables and grains. You, and you can take also milk. But you cannot take any animal foods. And you shouldn't even take foods like onion and garlic because they're very spicy and they also increase the agitation of the mind. Onion and garlic are aphrodisiacs and they stimulate the passion, they stimulate the lust in the mind. So you want to avoid these kind of foods. And this way you become a more calm and you become more peaceful. So you have to start to do these things. You have to chant Hare Krishna carefully and you have to also, don't, you have to be very careful what you eat. You should try to eat pure food, vegetarian food. And read the Bhagavad Gita also, All right? You have a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. You can read about the mind. Read the sixth chapter. The mind can be the friend. The mind can be the enemy. Your mind is your enemy. Your mind makes so many enemies for you. So many more enemies. Because you argue with everyone. You argue with everyone. You find fault with them. You don't find fault with yourself. You only see the good in yourself. And you see the faults in everybody else. That's very bad. You have to see your own faults. Don't look at others' faults. Look at your own faults. Then you'll start to improve. And you want to get rid of your own faults? You have to chant. You have to chant the Maha Mantra. All right, Prabhu? Okay, Maharaj. Thanks for the uh, answer. Uh, one last question, Maharaj. Uh, Hare Krishna Prabhu just wanted to ask, the person who is going to die, does they know 
that they will die in few more days. Do they know? They may know. Uh, yes, sometimes they know. Not always, but it's not uncommon. It happens. People know. One lady I know, she just told me her father just passed away. He, he called them up. He called up all his children five hours before and he said, I'm leaving the world today. And five hours later, he laid down and passed away. And he had nothing wrong. He, he was older. He was 70 plus. But he just passed away like that, you know, without disease or anything, very peacefully. Just, he, t he told his family members, I'm going to be leaving today. And he lay down and passed away, gave up his body. So it happens. You know. The point is, you have to know how to, how to leave the body. We have to be prepared. We have to hear the holy name. And we have to think about the Lord. We don't want to come back in the material world. If we come back into the material world, even you come in heaven, it's still not good because there's still birth and death. Everywhere in this material world, there's birth and death. You want to get out of this, this world. No more birth and death. If we have to come back again in this world, we've not passed. We've failed. Just like if you have to take your course again, you've failed. You didn't do it good. So the same way with the human life. If we have to come back again, take another material body, it's not good. We want to finish the, the, the birth and death. We want to go to the spiritual world. And to develop that qualification to enter the spiritual world, we have to develop an attraction for Krishna. We have to hear about Krishna. We have to chant the name of Krishna. You want to be with God, you have to think about Him. You have to be with Him. You have to start hearing about Him. It's very important. And particularly at the end of life, you want to do that. Srimad Bhagavatam is like that. The Srimad Bhagavatam is telling about a great king who was cursed to die. He had seven days to live. So he went to find a, somebody to guide him. What was his duty? What did he need to do to prepare to die? So you can read Srimad Bhagavatam and you can read how he prepared for seven days for leaving the body. He stopped eating and drinking, he stopped sleeping, and he just simply heard spiritual knowledge. Just like what we've been doing for the last two hours, you've been hearing about Krishna. So he did this for seven days, non-stop. And at the end of seven days, he gave up his body, he went back to Godhead, went to the spiritual world. All right? So thank you very much for all these questions. Okay, Maharaj. Thanks, Maharaj, actually, for the explanation. I think the question actually ends. Um, and thanks for your time, Maharaj. Actually, we, you spent almost two hours <laughs> till now. Uh -huh. and give the spiritual, I mean, the discourse, and after that you answer uh, tirelessly all the questions of the students. And also thanks to the students. Normally they won't ask a lot of questions in my class. Today they ask a lot of questions to you. So I believe they're interested in knowing the more about the spiritual and then the uh, soul. So, um, thanks again, Maharaj. In future, if there is any uh, interest from the student or anything, we will call you again. Okay, very happy. If there's any questions, any need, yeah, please let me know. I'm always free. You can yes, give a class. Thank you so much for all your questions. I appreciate your intelligent people. You're all nice, good, intelligent brains there. So, you try to read our books and learn this Krishna conscious philosophy. So, thank you so much for your time. Have a good day. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj.